We're going to be in the book of Exodus this morning, Exodus chapter 33, and we're going to actually read the whole chapter, uh, chapter 33. Scripture says in Exodus chapter 33, starting in verse 1, And the Lord said unto Moses, Depart and go up hence. In other words, leave this place. Thou and the people which thou hast brought up out of the land of Egypt, unto the land which I swore unto Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, Unto your seed will I give it. You know, right now, at this first verse, it's a little bit difficult to tell exactly what the Lord, the fact that He's actually irritated. God's irritated with the people of Israel, and He utilizes the term, He says, the people that you brought up. He says, I want you to lead, that you brought out of Egypt, I want you to bring them. And then you don't even realize it in verse 2, but it's another sign that he's not happy with them. But he says, I will send an angel before you. In other words, I'm not going to be there, but I was going to send an angel before you. And I will drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Unto a land flowing with milk and honey. For I will not go up in the midst of thee, for you are a stiff-necked people, lest I consume thee in the way. And when the people heard these evil tidings, they mourned, and no man did put on his ornaments. And the Lord had said unto Moses, Say unto the children of Israel, You are a stiff-necked people. I will come up into the midst of thee in a moment and consume thee. Therefore, now put off thy ornaments from there, from thee, that I may know what to do unto thee. In other words, you know, the ornaments could have been, there, there were some levels of jewelry, but also th things that they would wear upon, upon their heads. And the ornaments were a sign of joy, a sign of, uh, of thankfulness, a sign of prosperity. Recently in the chapter before, I was going to talk about a little bit more once I got done reading, we're coming off the hills of whenever the children of Israel, whenever Moses was on the mountain receiving the law, and the children of Israel talked Aaron into making a golden calf for them. So they took their ornaments that they did have at that point in time. They gave them to Aaron in order to make this, this idol. And now God's saying there's no time. This is not the time for you to be joyful. This is not the time for you to be wearing ornaments. I am not pleased with you. Moses and Moses took the tabernacle and pitched it without the camp. Now this is different then the, then the tabernacle that's later on going to be erected where God gives all of the requirements or all of the building uh, specifications where he would meet with the people of Israel. This is before that. This was also called the tent of meeting. And this is where God would meet with Moses. But as you can see, it's saying that Moses took the tent and he pitched it outside of the camp. And the idea is, is that before the tent was right there in the midst of the camp. Because even still, this was before the tabernacle was, was erected. This is where God's presence would dwell with the people of God. And now God, God's saying, I don't want it right there in the middle of the camp. I want you to, to, to pitch it off to the side and I'm going to come talk to you. So Moses took the tabernacle and he pitched it without the camp, afar off from the camp, and called it the tabernacle of the congregation. And it came to pass that everyone which sought the Lord went out into the tabernacle of the congregation, which was without the camp. And it came to pass, when Moses went out unto the tabernacle, that all the people rose up and stood every man at his tent door and looked after Moses until he was gone into the tabernacle. And it came to pass, as Moses entered into the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar, representative of God's presence, descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle. And the Lord talked with Moses. And all the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle door, and all the people rose up and worshipped every man in his tent door. And the Lord spoke unto Moses face to face, as a man speaks unto his friend. And he turned again into the camp. But his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. And Moses said unto the Lord, See thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said... I know you by name and have also, and, and you have also found grace in my sight. Now, therefore, I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way 
that I may know you, that I may find grace in thy sight, and consider that this nation is your people. And he said, God's responding, my presence shall go with you, and I will give you rest. And he said unto him, this is Moses responding, if your presence goes, if your presence goes not with me, carry us not from here. For wherein shall it be known here that I and your people have found grace in your sight? Am I asking a question? Is it not in the fact that you go with us? So shall we be separated? And I, I and your people from all the other people upon the face of the earth? And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that you have spoken. For you have found grace in my sight. And I know you by name. And he said, I beseech ye, or I, I beg you, show me your glory. Moses wants more. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, you can't see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me, and you shall stand upon a rock. There's a place by me, and you shall stand upon a rock, and it shall come to pass, while my glory passes by, that I will put you in the cliff of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand while I pass by. And I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. You know, just as I was reading it, and I've thought of this concept before, that it almost seems to be contradictory whenever you read it, because it's like it says that God would show up and he would meet with Moses and talk to Moses like a man would talk to his friend. And then it says, no man can see my face. And so it's kind of like, well, which one is it? Well, truth be told, whenever God's going to put Moses in this cliff of the rock and put his hand and only show him his back the back parts of who he is, he's actually giving Moses a greater revelation of who he is at that moment in time than when he sits with him at the tent of meeting. Because remember, God's showing up as a cloud, a pillar of a cloud. And it's kind of like the idea, even whenever the, if you'll remember on the day of atonement, when the high priest would go in between the veil, what would he have to bring with him? Do you remember that? He would have to bring a censer. Mm -hmm. It would have a hot coal in it and he'd put incense on it because the incense acted and provided a, cl a cloud. It enveloped the high priest. It, it provided an intercession or a go-between between between him and the very presence of God. And so whenever God, God's showing up and he's talking to Moses more closely than when he's talking to anybody else, there's no question about that. And he's conversing with him. And he's obviously he's letting Moses ask questions and he's answering Moses. At the same time, whenever he's talking about putting Moses in the cliff of the rock, he's talking about something that's even more intimate than what Moses has ever known before. He's talking about allowing Moses to see. So you see, I, I guess I'm going on and on right now, but I'm just trying to make a point. It's, it's, it's kind of like an idiom. It's like, a, it's like a figure of speech whenever God says he would talk to Moses as a man face to face as a man talks to because his presence was with Moses but Moses isn't really seeing the face of God does that make sense what I'm trying to say and that whenever he sees him at this rock it's going to be closer than what he's ever he's, God's going to give him an even greater revelation and allow him to see him in a way like he never did before I mentioned it while I was reading, but this chapter directly follows where Moses had gone to Mount Sinai to get the law for the children of God, but yet the people became impatient. They became impatient, waiting on God, waiting on God's word, and they, they got Aaron to consent to them. And Aaron took their jewels and he made them this idol. And their long presence in Egypt, which we've talked about it multiple times as a type of the world, and their inexperience in serving God, it ultimately caused them to turn back to what they had previously been accustomed to. When they didn't get what they wanted, when they didn't get it in the timing that they wanted it, they reverted back to what they had learned from the world all those years that they had lived there. I mean, for them, it was to worship a golden calf. For you and I, it's whatever it was that we knew from the world. 
or whatever it was, however we experienced it, whatever we did to calm our pain, to numb our pain, things from the past that helped us to get through before we really knew the Lord. There's always a draw and a temptation to revert back to old behavior, the things that you used to draw upon and, 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 and look to, to, to make you escape the moment for a period of time. And that's basically what they're doing. You know, it's difficult sometimes to disconnect from familiarity, especially whenever you're going on other things in your life aren't going the way that they're supposed to. Many times we want to hold on to something that we've grown accustomed to because it, it, it causes almost like a shakiness and nervousness to let go of the last little things that we previously knew, if that makes sense. Um, and so that there's a danger just like it was for them. It, it also is. It also is for us. And God's response in chapter 33 is that they're supposed to keep moving forward. He said, get up from hence. In other words, you need to get up from this place and you need to go where it is that I've called you to go. I've said it multiple times and I don't I don't mean to belabor the point. I know you already know this, but God doesn't change his mind. His plan's not changing. He said, go to the place that I swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Amen. And he, that was the promise that he gave to them. And, and also for us as the people of God, it's important that we be reminded that he doesn't change his mind. And, and that even when believers find themselves in a place where they have fallen backwards or not continued in the direction that God instructed, they can be sure that he hasn't changed his mind. And his will is that they keep moving towards the intended destination. For Israel, the intended destination <coughs> was the promised land. For us, we're to continue to travel to the city that Abraham was looking for. Go, go to Hebrews chapter 11, verses 8 through 10. I love this scripture. It reminds me of, it's really where I got the first title to my first point, Pilgrim's Progress. I, before we ever even read that book in the church on that Sunday night before we stopped Sunday night services, this scripture always made me think of that book because I had, I don't think I'd ever read the book, but I understood the, the concept behind it. And basically you could look at Abraham like he's Christian in Pilgrim's Progress. It says, by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance. So God's telling Moses, I need you to get up from here. I need you to go to the place that I swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is the promise. This is the swearing that God told to Abraham. And this is when Abraham got up and went. He obeyed. He went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he sojourned. That means he traveled in the land of promise as in a strange country. So whenever Abraham was traveling in that land that was promised, it was a strange country because <laughs> They had not actually inhabited the land yet, right? God had promised it, but he's just walking around there long before, hundreds of years before they actually get the land. And he's sojourning like a stranger in the land. He's dwelling in tabernacles, another word for tent, with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which has foundations whose builder and maker is God. I can't help but think about that book. And in the book, Christian is looking, he's traveling to go towards the celestial city. And then it, it makes me think of Abraham. And even way back in the beginning of his journey, he was traveling and looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. That, that gives me, you know, it reminds me that we're to keep following after God and his will which is to keep his word until the day that we see him and the journey is completed. That brings me to point number one. It's the prayer of the pilgrim. That's what I call point number one, the prayer of the pilgrim. Show me your way. Exodus 33, 13. Now, therefore, I pray thee, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way that I may know. He goes on to say that I may know thee. And that word know there is describing to become familiar with someone, to know someone. The idea when you get to know somebody, when you build a relationship with someone and you really know them, you know what they like, you know what they dislike. And what Moses is saying is, is that I need to know you. I need to become familiar with you so that I'll know what you like, what you dislike. 
and that I may find grace, grace in your sight and consider that this nation is your people. He's saying, I need you to show me the way. The prayer of the pilgrim. I need, you to, I need you to show me who you are. To be truthful, he kind of knows physically where God wants him to go. He's taking it a step further. He's saying, I need to know you spiritually. I know where you, what the physical and the, the intended destination is. It's the promised land. You told us from the get-go where we were supposed to go. We just ain't never made it there yet. And, and, but I need to know you and find grace in your sight. And by the way, don't forget, these are your people, God. And you're the one. It, there ain't no Moses here that, that let them out of here. You're the one that let us out. You called me. You the, you're the one that was burning in that bush. You're the one that told me to come over there. And, you know, Moses is just reminding the Lord of what the Lord said. I'm not preaching confession principle here, but what I'm trying to say is when the Word of God says something, Moses is reminding, hey, I'm not the deliverer here. Yes, you called me and I want to be obedient to you, but no, you're the one. These are your people, right? And I mean, and God goes, whenever Moses says it, God, God's reminded, yeah, you're right. It's not that he forgot. He just wants to remind, he wants Moses to remember his word. He wants Moses to remember the plan. You know, I would imagine, I mean, think about it. How irritating was it for Moses? I mean, he goes away. You know, the people are down there being impatient and they're doing their thing. But it's like, you know, in Moses, yeah, he's, he's in the presence of the Lord, but he's, he's serving the people, right? He's serving God, but he's serving the people. And then he comes back and he finds that the people ha have just completely gone off and done their own thing. And so it's got to be irritating for him, right? I, I mean, he comes back and he sees what they've done. It's got to be irritating for, them, for him. And, and so he's having this, this conversation with the Lord and he's reminding the Lord, these are your people and then we need you to go with us. There's something that they have in common to, to what we have also in common with one another. The pilgrim wants to know the will of God. What I'm trying to say is the Christian, the true believer, wants to know the will of God. Moses wants to know the will of God. They want to know that they're headed in the right direction. Manny prayed, you know, Manny asked for, Manuel asked for prayer this morning. You know, pray for direction. We've got some things coming up, right? And, and, and we don't never really want to go in the wrong direction. There's a lot of times people make rash decisions. Christians do it. I talk to people all the time. And I mean, I realize now, I mean, we've all made rash decisions. I've made rash decisions. And the, the only problem with a rash decision is not that God won't be with you if you make it, but you made it. And sometimes they're not that easy to get out of, right? And whenever that happens, you, you're going you're gonna to have to have grace to go through it. The truth be told, though, that we can hear from God and we can make the right decisions at times also. Amen. And, and it's much better whenever we make the right decision and we go in the right direction. Amen. 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 Uh, so anyway, and there's a, there's a whole lot of, of application that you could take that to. What I mean is, is making the right decision, making the right choice. There's, there's a lot of ways that you could apply that to your life, right? <coughs> and sometimes I feel like I got to spell it out, but job situations, changes in jobs. Financial decisions, so many different things that we could apply this aspect to our life when it comes to wanting to know the will of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Wanting to know which direction to go. The way that God shows us his will is he shows us through his word and his presence. I believe that yeah. Ephesians chapter four, verses 11 through 14. Yeah. Ephesians four, 11 through 14. It says, and he gave. I'm talking about Jesus. He gave some apostles, some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. Not that you would be perfect and without any blame, but that you would become mature in the faith. <clears throat> for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. That's really what that word edify means to be built up. It's like kind of like an architectural concept of being built up upon a solid foundation. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect or a completed man. Unto the measure of the stature 
of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth, in other words, from this time forward, be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of man and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. So really what the Apostle Paul is saying here is, is that he's contrasting <coughs> the instruction of the Lord because he's saying that, that Jesus gave to the body apostles, pastors, prophets, evangelists, teachers for a purpose. The purpose is that the body would be built up, that they would be instructed in the knowledge of God, and that as they are instructed in the knowledge of God, they're going to be built up, they're going to become mature in the faith, and that the result of, it's really the focus is on doctrine, but, but that God uses men to give that doctrine to his people. And that, that doctrine, what it does is, is it provides a contrast between that and false doctrine. Good doctrine, false doctrine. False doctrine, and we've talked about this, we've taught Ephesians before, the whole book. The slight of man is the word cubia. I remember that. I didn't even look it up because I can remember that. It's spelled C-U-B-E-I-A in the Greek, and it's where the word dice comes from. It's like a cube, dice. And so it's a, it's a trickery thing. So the, the enemy, through false doctrine, through false apostles, causes a, a, brings trickery to the mind and allows people to believe that they have a good compass, but in reality, they got a bad compass. So the, the difference between what I'm trying to say is, is that God's word and his presence give direction. Moses is asking God for direction. And what I'm trying to say is that it's the word of God and the presence of God that gives the believer of God proper direction. But whenever you don't have proper direction and instead you're brought in under a false gospel or you just don't know the gospel at all, you're like a ship without a rudder and without a compass. And you're being tossed to and fro upon a tempestuous sea and you don't know how you're going to go. You don't know where you're going to go and you certainly don't know how you're going to get there. So an understanding of the word will help to lead someone on the right path and false doctrine will cause people to be pushed away off course and to get lost along the way. The second thing I wanted to talk about a little bit real quick was his presence. Because Moses is saying, see, really and truly I see here the word and the presence being a situation in the text that we're starting with in Exodus. Why? Because Moses is on the mountain getting the law, which is the word of God, and the people aren't very concerned about that. And now Moses is saying, okay, if you're going to lead and guide us, we need your presence to go with us. And, and I want you to look at Romans chapter 1 verse 7 because right now I'm talking about presence. First I talked about the word, now I'm talking about presence. And in Romans chapter 1 verse 7, the Apostle Paul in his letter, this is just one example. The Apostle Paul wrote this multiple times. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So grace and peace be to you. And like I said, there's many times in Paul's letters that he uses this terminology because grace and peace work together. So the grace of God is given to man through the spirit of God and is made possible because of the completed work of the son of God. Right. So I, the, the main point that I'm trying to make here is that grace leads to peace and I've tried to establish this many times, but where does grace come from? <laughs> How is grace given to the believer? Who? I mean, we're talking about the Trinity. If you were going to say the Holy, Spirit. the Holy Spirit, that's exactly right. The Spirit of God is the one that gives the grace of God to the people of God. He does all of that and can do the, all of that because of the, fact of the work of the Son of God. Because of what Jesus did at the cross, he paid the penalty of sin, the exchange took place, he took our guilt, gave us his righteousness, now the presence of God lives in man, dwells with man, amen? amen. And the grace of God can be present with man. The main, I'm not trying to get too technical on you, but I think it's important that we understand, we understand some things. The Spirit of God dispenses grace into the life of the believer. And where the Spirit of God is and the grace of God is, there is peace. Yes. Yeah. Look at this right here, Colossians 3.15. <clears throat> and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you are called in one body, 
and be ye thankful. So this word rule right here, let the peace of God rule in your heart. This word rule in the Greek, it literally means umpire. So they had some kind of a concept of an umpire back in those days. In the, they had all these Greek games, all these competitions, and there was somebody that was calling the shots. Somebody that was saying yes, no. Does that make sense? Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, strike, ball, yes, no, safe, out, yes, no. The Spirit of God is to act like an umpire the, through the peace of God. Where there is grace, there is peace. Whenever the peace of God is present in your life in the midst of a circumstance then what God is saying is that if there's peace in this situation, then you're heading in the right direction. You can't go contrary to the Word of God. If you know the Word of God, there's a lot of plays and steps. Listen, let's just be all real with one another. There's a lot of steps that we will take that are completely out of the will of God. But the Word of God warned us not to go there. The Word of God was very clear that we weren't supposed to take that step to begin with. But then even once we've taken steps, sometimes though we feel as though we're following the word of God, guess what? There's secondary too, because the presence of God brings the grace of God. Where there's grace, there's peace. But where there's a lack of peace, it's a symptom or a sign that something's not right, right? And so we're to let the peace of God rule in our hearts and to allow us to know the will of God. In, in the case of Israel, they disregarded his word, like I said, because he was on the mountain. They reverted back to the ways of the world. And Moses also knows that without the, will, without the presence of God, they will never make it to their intended destination. So that was my point number one. The prayer, prayer of the pilgrim. Show us your way. We need your direction, right? And it's the word of God and it's the presence of God that does that for the life of the believer. Point number two. Until you know him, you will never know his way. That's right. Until you know him, you'll never know his way. Look at Exodus chapter 33, verse 16. For wherein shall it be known here that I and your people have found grace in your sight? Is it not in that you go with us? So shall we be separated, I and your people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. Based upon the way that God's people responded while he was gone, Moses knows that without the presence of God going with them every step of the way, there, there won't be just a problem of getting where they're supposed to go, but they will also get swallowed up by the world. He said that. He said, how are we going to be separated? What's going to make us different than the nations that are around us. This is what separates us from the world. It's always been that way and it will always be that way. It's the presence of God abiding with or in the people of God that makes them separate and different from the world. Look at John 14, 17. I use this scripture so much. I think I used this last week. John 14, 17. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it sees him not, Neither does it know him. The world doesn't know him. Until you know him, you're not going to know where you're going. But you know him, for he dwells with you, and he shall be in you. Whenever, whenever John is saying this, he dwells with you. When Jesus is saying this through John, he dwells with you, but he will be in you. What he's, he's talking about literally what we're talking about out of Exodus 33. My presence will go before you. My presence will be with you. God's presence has been with Israel, but God's presence is going to be in God's people. Look at 2 Peter 1.4. We're talking about the presence of God. We're talking about the connection that God's people have to the presence of God. And that through that, there's a knowledge and an understanding of God. Look, actually, look at verse 3. Go back to verse 3 for me. According as His divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that has called us to glory and virtue. You see that word knowledge there? I know I've used to teach this all the time, but that word in the Greek is, is epignosis. And this word gnosis just means knowledge, and this word is really, it's a preposition, it means above. 
So that, that what that means is it's above and beyond just regular knowledge. You can know something from a textbook. Uh, this is my illustration all the time. Whenever I just use Sean and myself because we went to nursing school. Whenever we went to nursing school, they had textbook stuff you had to learn. They call that didactics, textbook stuff. But then you had to take the textbook stuff and you had to go do clinicals. It's a practicum, the practical aspect of it, where you take the knowledge that you learn and you apply it on a regular basis, on a daily basis. It's a whole different type of learning. You can tell a nursing student what a catheter bag is and that you got to empty it, but then the first time you got to empty a catheter bag, it's kind of weird. I mean, I know that's not a big deal to empty a catheter bag, but I can remember the first time that I went to clinicals. I never know how to empty no catheter bag. You know? And, and so what I'm saying is, is that it's the same thing with Christianity. No, it's not exactly the same thing, but the point is, is that we can learn a lot of the Scripture. We can have a lot of head knowledge, but then we have to live life out. And there's an application of the word of God that has to take place in our daily lives. Does that make sense? That's what that word epignosis means. It's greater than just an, a, a book learning about Jesus, but it's actually a mixture of the learning of the word of God and the application of God's word in your daily life as you experience the journey called life. And that knowledge allows us to have access when it talks about godliness, it's talking about living for the Lord. Amen? But look at verse 4. It says, whereby, unto us, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Main point that I'm trying to make is you can't know, until you know God, you don't know, you're not going to know where you're going. Right? But not only that is the connection of the presence of God because it's because of that close connection between us and the presence of God that we can even know God. And right here is talking about the fact that we've become a partaker of his divine nature. It's, it's more than just that the fact that the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit lives in us, but we're actually drawing upon and receiving strength from the nature of God. It's like a joint participation we're, we're in communion with God and God is, God is giving us his strength. He's nourishing the believer, if you will. The world will always try to entice us and call us back. But the scripture says that having become a partaker of the divine nature, we've escaped the lust of the world. Point number three, I guess I forgot to put my numbers in here. <laughs> but point number three, I'm just going to make it up because I didn't even write it. It has to do with being in Christ. Let's just make it real simple. We don't have to get fancy. Point number three has to do with being in Christ. Listen, if, we're, if we need the pilgrim, if the pilgrim's prayer is, Lord, I need to know your will. I need to know where you're going to send me. And the second step is, I'm, until I know you, I'm not going to know where I'm going. Then what we need to understand is, is that there's a level of intimacy. I know we mentioned it just now, but we're about to get into it even greater. To be reminded that God's plan is, is that we would be in Christ. Amen. Let's look at Exodus chapter 33, verse 21. You could call point number three, you know him because you're in him. Or you can know him because you're in him. The Lord said, behold, there is a place by me and you shall stand upon a rock. I don't think that you can spend enough time to really get it. I mean, there's a lot of depth to this. There's a place by me. A place is, it could be, in the Hebrew, this word takes on a variety of meaning and it's used in a very broad context. It can describe a place where someone lives, but it can also just describe a location. But what God's saying is that there's a place that's by me. There's a place that you can, you know what I put in my notes that under, my, under the definition for place, because this is what it says. The definition, literally, a place to live or just a place of location, somewhere you are. And in my notes, I added this to the definition, a position. There's a position or a place that's near me. Right. And then and, and then he also says you're going to stand there and it means to establish oneself, to firmly plant oneself in this place. He says there's a place by me. You're going to stand there. You're going to establish yourself there. 
It's on a rock. But then he goes on to say this. He says, I'm going to put you in a cliff of the rock. So you're not just going to stand on the rock. That's where you're going to start off. You're going to, but, but I want you to know there's a place of nearness to me. You know, the book, the, Psalm chapter 91 talks about the secret place. There's scriptures without that talk about the secret place of the Most High. Those that, those that abide under the shadow of the Almighty. It talks about the secret place of God. I remember whenever the Lord first started getting, getting a hold of me, I didn't really understand the message of the cross. I really didn't have a whole lot of good doctrine, but I knew something was happening in me. And I kept worshiping the Lord. And it was whenever I first worshiped the Lord that first morning when I got up and I told God, you know, whatever I told him in reference to things that had happened with my sister. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, it was like grace poured out of heaven like rain and just saturated me. All I can do is tell you that when you're going through things, and I don't think that we do that enough. When you're going through things, if you get desperate enough and you need the Lord to show up in the midst of your situation, amen? Then the, what you got to do is, is you got you to plead with him. He sees the heart of his people. He sees the brokenness and the contriteness of their spirit. And the good news is that Jesus died on the cross to give us access to the presence of God. But many times, even though we know that, we don't avail ourselves. I'm talking about the preacher too. We don't avail ourselves to accessing the presence of God. I didn't have a whole lot of good doctrine. All I had was a whole lot of desperation. And on that day, I'm just telling you, on that morning when I cried out to God, God showed up in a big way. And something happened and broke in me. I'm still not the same. I'm not the same as I was then. And I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not on fire like I was then. But I ain't jacked up like I was then either. That, that moment in time has completely transformed my life. Amen. And I will never be the same again. Amen. God revealed himself to me in a way I can't go back. I don't want to. Why would I want to? But I can't. I, that's a lie. That's a counterfeit. I cannot go backwards back into the world. There's no way that I could ever do that. What I'm trying to say, though, is this, is that when that happened, I didn't know what to think about it. I didn't know what, how to reference it. I tried to talk to people about it. I tried to tell the preacher when I was going, when I was going to the church about it. And to be honest with you, people didn't, people thought I was crazy. You did. Y'all know how much I talk. Dude, <laughs> there were, nobody else, like I was just talking about Jesus, not even to nothing. The people that love Jesus and love his word, they just thought I was becoming some kind of self-righteous whatever, because of whatever they thought, and they, and they were getting irritated with me. And then and then the people that didn't want to talk about Jesus, they were really irritated with me, because like, dude, let's just, we used to talk about football. Can we talk about football again? <laughs> right? And so, but I didn't know what to call it, but I knew that, and so I started just reading all kind of different stuff. Anything I get my hands on. And one of the things that kept coming back to me was this secret place. I didn't understand what I was reading, but I was like, man, I found a secret place. You know what I'm saying? It's like, this place that I entered into right here is a secret place. Yeah. And, and I would hear all kind of people say all kind of different stuff about the secret place. And I was like, yeah, that don't sound right. But I know one thing. I found a secret place place where it was just me and the Lord and in that place some powerful powerful things were taking place now what I will tell you is uh, even though I didn't know anything about doctrine the Lord brought me straight back to the book of Romans and I, I could go back if I could find them and they're probably actually in there on the shelf write notes and the scriptures where God was bringing me to were all having to do with the blood all having to do with the cross but I had no clue about proper doctrine. But what I'm trying to tell you about right here is that I believe with all my heart that what God's talking about is he's putting Moses in a secret place. He's putting Moses in a special place, a place that he's had reserved for Moses, a place where he wants to reveal himself to Moses in a way like never before. And it starts off, it's a place by me. It's on a rock, but not just a rock. You're not going to just stand on the rock. I'm going to put you in a rock. Multiple scriptures that talk about Jesus being the rock. 1 Corinthians 10.4. Yes. That word cliff, is that the same as cleft? It's very similar. Yes, sir. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's a cleft in the rock. I'm about to break it down, but that's a good question. I mean, because it's the only time it's used in, in the Old Testament. I can't find it. It's, 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 it's the only time in the, in the King James it's used 
and it is where it's spelled with an I instead of an E. But yes, it is a cleft in the rock. 1 Corinthians 10, 4. And did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Jesus. I'm just using scriptures right now. Romans chapter 9, verse 33. That talked about Jesus as our rock. We know that, but I'm just reminding you. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion, another name for Jerusalem, a stumbling stone and rock of offense. And whosoever believes on him shall not be ashamed. But in the Exodus passage, God said that he would put Moses in the rock. That word cleft literally in the Hebrew, it's a fissure, a fissure, which is like a cleft. It's like an opening. Cleft is the old King James for a fissure, which means a crack or an opening or a tear. Now, whenever I was sitting here looking at this and looking at that word, what comes to your mind when you hear the word tear or you think of a fissure or you think of a cleft, a New Testament concept? Does anything come to your mind? Veil. Because, huh? The veil. The veil's a great one, a tear. But, but something else, a hole or an opening is what we're talking about here. I can't get, huh? This tomb? Well, no, no but, but for me, this is, but, it, but it was open. The tomb was opened. There's nothing wrong with these answers. I'm just telling you what happened to me. Because what happened to me when I see this word is I think of the hole in his side. Okay. Yeah. The, it's a tear. It was a, it was a, and there's many songs of, uh, during the church age that talk about that. This similar type word that they would use. There's this old hymn called, Oh, What a Savior. I don't really know the words, but I just Googled the first few words. Because I remember this word. I think whenever I preached for Brother Larson, this word stuck out to me. The word, this is what it says. Oh, what a Savior. His heart was broken on Calvary. His hands were nail scarred. His side was riven. He gave his blood. Riven to split apart. Just like a rock was split apart and provided an opening, Jesus' side was split apart. It was a fissure. It was an opening. And out of that fissure of the rock, named Jesus, flowed blood and water. Amen? Amen. Flowed blood and water, and his blood bought us. Look at Revelation 5 9. It says, They sung a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. A riven side that flowed forth blood and water, and he purchased us. Out of the world with his blood, the water of his spirit is in us and flows out of us. Look at John 7, 38 through 39. Jesus said, he that believes on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spoke he of the spirit, which they that believe on him should receive for their Holy Ghost was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. And just as God did for Moses, he does for us. He, puts, he doesn't just put us near the rock, but he puts us in the rock. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. According as he has chosen us in him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Chosen us in him before the foundation of the world of the world before there was ever an earth formed before the first man fell God had a plan where the man that was in him would be chosen you gotta be found in him in him they would be holy in him they would be without blame and I would hope that all of us would find ourselves in him this morning so I just want that's really all I have for you this morning I just want to remind you that that the prayer of the pilgrim is that he needs to know the direction of the Lord. The direction of the Lord is given by the spirit, spirit and the grace of the Lord, which brings peace in the life of the believer. And you and I can have access to all that direction and peace because of the plan of God, which puts us in Christ.